Today we're going to talk about the rider's pelvis and the importance of the skill that riders need to have to be able to move their pelvis without it meaning that the rest of their body has to move to accommodate the movement in their pelvis. So we're looking at how well we can dissociate movement in the pelvis from the rest of our body. And this is important when we're on the horse because the horse is going to be moving our pelvis. We need to be able to move quite a lot in our pelvis to be able to accommodate the movement in the horse's back and not block the horse's back. And we need to have enough flexibility in our body to, for the pelvis to move without moving the rest of us and throwing us off balance. And we have to have enough stiffness in our body that we're carrying ourselves and we're managing our own weight and our own balance. So it's a, a balance or a compromise that we need in our body between flexibility and stiffness and stability. For now, we're gonna explore four different movements in our pelvis while being able to dissociate that from the rest of our body. Once we know which movements we find easy or difficult or which directions we find easy or difficult, we've then got some useful information to improve any asymmetry in our own body. And just to be aware of asymmetry in our own body, we're never gonna remove it completely, just as we're never gonna remove it completely from the horse's body. But when we have an understanding of our own challenges in our body, we can do some work off the horse and then on the horse to be able to improve. I have a model of a pelvis here that I want to show you so that you can understand what's happening in your own body. So in this model, I've got the lowest two bones of the spine. So these are the last two bones of your lumbar vertebra. Here's the pelvis. On each side of the pelvis, you've got the hip socket. So this is where the top of your thigh or your femur fits in there. There's a ball and socket there. The femur's got a ball and this is the socket. This is the front. And this is the back. So if I turn it around and show you from behind, you can see these knobbly bits here. I might put it sideways for you. These knobbly parts are what you can feel in your back. If you put your hand on your lower back, those knobbly bits in the middle of your spine, that's what you're feeling there. And then the other way to think about orientating yourself is feeling for this piece of the bone here. So if you put your hand on your hip, or what people commonly think about when they're putting their hand on their hip, this is where you're going to be putting your hand. So I'll show you on me. If I put my hand on my hip, that's that bit of bone here. And you can see there's a, a pointy bit at the front here, a knobbly bit, and that's what you can feel, again, at the front here. So that's a good landmark to orientate yourself in your body so you can feel this part quite easily and you might be able to feel those knobbly parts but this is probably a good place to orientate yourself. The other thing to think about riding is your seat bones so that's these two bony parts of the pelvis here on the bottom and that's where you're sitting on the horse. We want to be able to feel the horse moving our body and be sensitive enough to our own body to feel quite subtle movements. And that's how we are listening to the horse. We're listening to the horse's movement through our body. And the horse is also listening to us. The horse is very aware of where we have our weight, how we're moving. And we can use that to communicate back to the horse. So we're listening with our body and we're also communicating back to the horse. We may want to influence the horse's movement by changing the way that we're moving. We might want to decelerate or accelerate a movement within our own body and that's going to influence how the horse is moving and that's our way of communicating with the horse through our pelvis. So it's a two-way communication, we're listening and influencing and these things are happening almost at the same time in a loop, a continuous loop. In order for us to be able to receive the movement from the horse's back, we have to allow our pelvis to be moved without losing our balance. And in order to do that, we have to learn how to dissociate movement between our pelvis and the rest of our body. And the way that we can do that, particularly, is through the spine. So there's movement that can occur between the pelvis and the spine. And we have to be able to become quite skilled at listening to that movement and being able to influence it. So I'm gonna show you on this model 
four different movements that can happen between our pelvis and our spine. So the first one is a rotational movement. So I'm going to keep the pelvis still and move the spine. So the spine can rotate towards the right and it can rotate towards the left. It can also lean towards the right and it can lean towards the left. My model doesn't show this very well, but there's also a lateral shift that can occur. So it can laterally shift to the left and it can laterally shift to the right. And the fourth movement, which is one that most people are familiar with, are what happens when our pelvis tilts forward and backwards. And I'm going to show you from the side. So I'm going to turn the pelvis around. And people commonly are quite familiar with the movement of our pelvis going forwards and backwards on the horse. What happens in our spine to accommodate that is there's a hollowing and a flattening of our lower back. And I'm going to use this bit of plastic to demonstrate. So if you imagine that this bit of plastic is the spine, and what I want you to think about is as the pelvis tilts backwards, the spine is going to flex. And as the pelvis tilts forward, the spine is going to hollow. So I'm going to show you those movements from behind as it relates to the horse moving when it's walking. Most people are quite familiar with the forward and back tilt of their pelvis. I'm going to show you from the side actually for this. The forward and back tilt of the pelvis where the lower back is hollowing and straightening. And oftentimes people are very aware of that movement and they imagine that their pelvis is moving the same on the right and left. But actually there's some other movements that need to happen differently one side compared to the other side. So I'm going to show you those now as related to the horse. I just showed you keeping the pelvis still and moving the spine, but when you're on the horse, the horse is moving you. Here are the sit bones. This is where you're sitting on the horse, and the horse is moving you from underneath. So you need to be able to accommodate that movement between your pelvis and your spine without shifting your weight, and in order to do that you've got to move your spine relative to your pelvis. So that would look like the pelvis is moving underneath and the spine is staying still, or the pelvis is moving in this direction and staying still. And then also that front backwards. My model doesn't demonstrate it very well, but as I showed you with the bit of plastic, the pelvis is going forwards and backwards and the spine is hollowing and flattening to accommodate that. I'm going to explain how that relates to the movement of the horse. So we're going to think about the horse's hind limbs whilst you're riding the horse when it's walking. So if we think about the left hind limb, I'm going to use my hand to demonstrate. So as the left hind limb leaves the ground and begins swinging forwards, this side of your pelvis or this seat bone is going to be lower than the one on the other side. So your left side is going to be lower than your right in this instance. As the horse's hind leg meets the ground, begins to take weight and push off, this seat bone is going to rise. The other thing that's going to happen is as well as it rising, almost at the same time, just fractionally afterwards, it's going to come forwards. So your seat bone is going to rise on that side and it's going to come forward on that side. So we need to be able to accommodate that within our spine. So we need to be able to keep our spine still and move our pelvis relative to our spine. Maybe calling the spine being still is a slight oversimplification because there is movement happening everywhere, but we need to be able to keep the spine facing forwards as the pelvis turns underneath it and as it rises and falls one side compared to the other. The other thing that's also happening at the same time is that movement of the pelvis tipping forwards and backwards. And that forwards and backwards movement happens twice in each gait cycle of the horse.